Hello and welcome to lecture 19 on numerical optimization. All right, in the last lecture, we used the derivatives of a function and the second derivative of a, of a function to figure out what are the local maxima and local minima of a function. And then we also used the value of a function to decide if those were also global maxima and global minima. Now, this works great if you have a function that you know the function and you know the derivative of that function. But a lot of functions are really complicated and we can't actually calculate their derivatives or we can't calculate the value of their derivative at a particular point. So this is where computers come in really handy. And so in this lecture and in the next couple lectures, we're going to transition a little bit to thinking about how we use computers to do important things in biology and the life sciences. All right. So I'm going to start this lecture by talking about algorithms and computers in general, and then we're going to talk about how to use computers to find the maxima and minima of a function. All right, so a key thing in a computer is an algorithm. So when you're building a computer program, you're building a whole bunch of different algorithms. And you can think of an algorithm like a board game. So if you've played a board game, you've essentially evaluated an algorithm. You first set up the board. So this is called initialization. All algorithms start with saying, okay, I have some initial values that I'm gonna start with. Sometimes these are really boring, like setting things to zero. And then you have a recursion step, which is saying, repeat this over and over and over again, or do this operation. And this is, could be think of as playing the different turns of the game, so playing different um, rounds. And then you have the output of the game, which is the winning portion, so deciding who wins at some point. All right. So as a step, let's think, or as an example, let's think about the coin game. So this is a really dumb, simple game where you have two teams where a coin is flipped a total of 21 times. On each flip, um, if the coin comes up heads, then team one gets a point. If it comes up tails, then team two gets a point. How would we write this game as an algorithm? Well, first we have to initialize the game. So we are caring about the number of points gathered by team one and team two, and initially neither team has any points. So you have team one is equal to zero points, and team two has zero points. All right, now you have the recursion step, which is the play of the game. So you're going to say for t equals one, two, dot, 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 up to 21, now you're going to flip a coin and if heads then team one plus plus so when i say plus plus this adds one so if you've ever heard about c plus plus it is like a little play on words which is c plus one all right, now you have if else, if it wasn't heads, then it was tails, and then team two plus plus. So this means tails. All right, now after 21 rounds, what do you get? Well, how do you decide who wins? If team one has more points then team two, then you are going to say team one wins. Else, and this is if team two has more points than team one, then team two wins. So then we have two wins. Okay. So that is our game written as an algorithm. Okay, so we can evaluate algorithms using three different types of statements, and we've already used some of these statements implicitly up above. And the first one of these is the for loop. So a for loop says do something a number of times. So in the previous section, we said flip a coin 21 times. So for example, we could say flip a coin i, in some amount of times from zero to four. So a lot of times computers start counting at zero. So when I say range of four, what this is actually saying is set i equal to first zero, then one, 
then two, then three. So we don't go all the way to four, but we count four starting at zero. So zero, one, two, three. So it's a little bit of weird counting. When you put a four in here, you end up counting only to three, but starting at zero. So if I were to print out the answer, just like you do in Python, for i equals one to range of zero, one, two, and three, this is actual Python code. And if I were to print this out, I would get zero, one, two, and three. All right, the next kind of statement that we can have is a while statement. While statements are super useful, but they're also a little bit risky. So they're risky because they can sometimes never end. But how we're gonna do it is we're gonna say, start with some value, this is our initialization, i equals zero, and then while i is less than some value, or while i does not equal some value, or while i is greater than some value, we have some criteria that we have to evaluate, and then we're gonna do something to i, and then we're gonna go back through this loop over and over and over again until this criteria is not met. All right, so for example, if i is equal to zero, while i is less than 10, so is i less than 10? Yes, it's zero. We're gonna do i equals i, so i is zero plus zero plus one. If you evaluate that all out, it comes out as being one, and we're gonna print that value. So we're gonna print one. Now, now i is one, so we're gonna go back up through here. Now i is one, so we have i less than 10. Yep, it is less than 10. So you have i equals one plus one plus one. All right, that is equal to three. So we're gonna print out the answer and we get three. Now we go back through the loop. Okay, is i less than three, uh, less than 10? Yes, three is less than 10. So we're gonna go through this loop again and we're gonna say i is equal to three plus three plus one which is equal to seven. Go through this loop again and we're print seven. All right, now we go through it one more time. Is i less than 10? Yes, it's seven. So we go through here again and we say seven plus seven plus one, which is equal to 15, and we print out 15. Now we come back and we try to do it again and it says 15, is 15 less than 10? No, it is not less than 10, and so it stops. So in this case, this is a good while loop, it does eventually stop. So we ended up with one, three, seven, and 15. So if you need to pause this video and go back through that loop and think about what happens every single time, then please do that. Note that computers are really special in that we can set a number equal to itself plus some other stuff. So this would be a bad mathematical statement, but it is a completely legitimate computer statement. So this is definitely not true mathematically speaking, but in a computer, we can set a new value of i depending on the old value of i. All right, the last statement that we have is an if or an else statement. So we use this up above where we say, if this is true, do this, if else, do this. Okay, and I'm gonna add another one, which is else if. So this tells us if it's not the first thing or the second thing or the third thing, do this. All right, so for example, if we start with j equals two, this is our initialization step. All right, if j is equal to one, notice that I put a double equal sign. So when you put a double equal sign in a computer, this often means ask this question, is j equal to one? This doesn't set j equal to one, it asked, is j equal to one? Is j equal to one? No, it's equal to two. Okay, else if j is equal to two, all right, that's true. So we go inside this loop and we wanna print out bonjour. So we print out output bonjour. If it wasn't equal to two, else, so suppose j was equal to four, it would neither fit into this loop or it was fit into this loop. So everything else, so it's like a piecewise function, we're gonna print out a little Coleman. All right, so another way of writing this is f of x. It's a piecewise function. It's gonna be either hello, if x equals one, it's gonna be bonjour, if x is equal to two, and it's gonna be Bill Coleman, else, otherwise. So this would have be how you would write this piecewise function mathematically. All right, so just to practice, let's draft the output of three different Python code snippets. 
First, for the first snippet, we're going to use the variable r if r is in this range from 0 to 4. Now remember how these ranges work. They start at 0, then they go up to 3. So they go up to the value you have in the argument, minus 1. So there's four total things, but one of them is 0. All right, so we're going to do if um, for r in this range. So we're first going to ask what happens when r is equal to 0. Well, then we go into this if else statement. Is r less than 1? Yes, it is. So we're going to print out the value of r. So we're going to print out 0. All right. Now we go through this loop again. Now r is equal to 1. Is r less than or equal to 1? Yes, it is. So we have r equals to 1, and we're going to print out 1. All right. Now let's go through this loop again. We're at the 2 value here. We go through here again. Two, is 2 less than or equal to 1? No, it's not. So we're going to fall into the else statement. In the else statement, we're going to print out 2 times r. So we have r equals to 2, and we're going to print out 4. All right. Finally, we go through here the last time for r equals 3. And is r equals 3 less than 1? No, it's not. So we go into here, and we're going to print out 6. So when r equals to 3, we print out 6. All right, so that was a fairly simple code snippet. Let's do a little bit more complicated one. Let's suppose that we have j equals 0, and we're going to use a while statement. So j has to be less than or equal to 5 to go in this for loop. And now we're going to do this for loop here. So if k, a new variable, not the same as that one, if k is less than or in this range from 0 to 3. So we have 0, 1, 2. Remember, you subtract 1. All right, so we go through the first time, j is equal to 0. Is j less than 5? Yes, it is. Now we have to go into this loop. So we have j equals to 0, and then we have, okay, we have k equals to 0, and then we end up with j equals the original j, 0, plus k, which is equal to 0, and we get 0. All right. Now, that was the first time through this for loop. Now we're going to go through that for loop again with k equals 1. So we have k equals 1. So then we have j is equal to our new value of j plus k, which is equal to 1. And this comes out to being 1. All right. Finally, we go through this for loop again for the 2. And we have k equals 2. So j is equal to the new value of j, which we just set to being 1, plus 2 which is equal to 3. All right, so now we have gone through this for loop for the 0 time, the 1 time, and the 2 time. All right, so now we have to go back out to the outside, and we have to ask, is j less than 5? Yeah, j is less than 5. It's equal to 3. So we're going to go through this while statement again. All right, so now we get back into the original for loop, so j is equal to 3, and we have k equals 0. So we start over with this for loop. All right, so if k is equal to 0, then we have j is equal to j, the new value of j, which is 3, plus 0, which is simply 3. Then we have k equals 1, so this is j equals 3 plus 1 is equal to 4. And then we have k equals 2, so j equals uh, 4 plus 2, which is equal to 6. All right, now we are going to go out to the outside loop again, and we say, is j less than 5? No, it's not. j is equal to 6, so we're done. So we get an ending result of j equals 6. Okay, so that is a little bit more complex code snippet. All right, and we're done. Now, what are we going to use all of this for? Well, one application is to find the maxima or the minima of a complicated function. So I've drawn a complicated function over here. How do we find the maxima and minima of this without doing a bunch of derivatives and first derivatives and second derivatives? Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we're going to use this thing called a stochastic hill climbing algorithm to find it. Now, there's lots of different methods for finding the maximum and minima of a function, um, but in this close class, we're going to just talk about this one called the stochastic hill climbing algorithm. So, just like any algorithm, this is going to have a couple of steps. The first step is the initialization. All right, how do we initialize a function? Well, in this case, we're going to pick an initial starting point in our x. So, we have our domain of our function, and we're going to pick an initial value. All right.
And then we're going to evaluate the function at that value. So you're finding the coordinate pair x0, y0. And once again, x0 here is completely random. You just pick one randomly from your domain. Then we enter our recursion step. And how the recursion step works is we're going to draw a little random change, a little random delta x, which we can see here. We have this little delta x that we pick at random. And then we're jumping from the green point to the blue point. And if the new value, which is x, your old value of x plus this random change, if the value of that new point is greater than the old point, then you're going to step. You're going to make that transition. You're going to step to the new point. So you're going to set your new value of x equal to this. If it's not greater than that, then you're going to try a new random step. So suppose I had originally jumped down, then I would reject that step and I'd take another jump, for example, maybe up. All right, so we're going to do this over and over and over again. So for example, suppose we start here and we jump here. Okay, that's good. And then suppose we take our next step and we jump here. Are we going to accept that or reject it? We're going to reject it because the value of the function here is greater than the value of the function there. So we reject that step. That goes away. Then we make our next jump. Suppose we jump from there to there. Okay, well the function increased, not by very much, but it increased a little bit. And you make another jump, maybe you jump downhill and you reject that jump. And then you jump uphill and you keep that jump and so forth and so forth until you've run the, the recursion a fixed number of times and you found an approximate maxima. All right. So here are some potential issues with this algorithm. Well, one of them is that it might jump, it jumps uphill, we step, and if we step uphill, we keep that step. If we step downhill, we get rid of it. But this can lead to us stepping uphill to a local maximum and not finding the global maximum. So it can be difficult to find the global max. And some ways to fix that is to take really long steps once in a while. So if we take a really long step, sometimes we'll reject that, but sometimes we'll take a really long step and we'll end up stepping up there. So we don't always want to take really small steps. Sometimes we want to take really big ones to jump from local minima or local maxima to global minima or global maxima. All right, so um, use your hill climbing algorithm to find the maxima of a fitness function, which is how evolution works.